So I would straight off jump into, you know, I'll start with the podcast. Uh, I'll be putting a couple of questions to you. So let's start with the first one. Uh, you know, there, there's been a thing which has been making headlines uh, where you have you spoken about how there's a WhatsApp movement uh, in financial services in India. So can you educate the audience about that? Sure. If you go back and look at uh, 2009, look at the state of the global industry, there was a move going from voice to data, from desktop internet to smartphones and mobile internet, from vast services to over the top services. And uh, there's a big shift happening. And uh, this shift was not caught by any large company. You know, at that time, you had the world's largest telecom companies, uh, AT and guys, and uh, all these guys. But they were, you know, still in the vast services. They were trying to bring in MMS. They didn't really get MMS going. And then you have the internet companies like Google and Facebook, which were focusing on desktop and identity. They were like Facebook Connect and so forth. And the real winner of that dramatic change in environment was not a large company with millions of dollars of revenue and the best, smartest people and all that, but a small startup like WhatsApp. Because fundamentally, WhatsApp realized that uh, you now with a smartphone, and they met on Android and uh, Apple, uh, you could have an OTD application that didn't depend on the provider. They use the mobile phone as the uh, ID, and they use the contact list in the phone as a way to get viral. And they began with messaging. And that's what led to it becoming so successful. And today, uh, they do, WhatsApp does 30 billion messages a day. And the entire SMS world of all the big mobile operators is 20 billion. And this is a company with 40 employees, just like you guys. So imagine that a company out of nowhere started by a Ukrainian immigrant. Uh, completely uh, changed the rules of this game and big companies were left uh, stuck. So that's what happened when you have disruption. And our, our thesis is that we have the same uh, point in the financial sector in India. Uh, one is that uh, the digitization is happening in a big way. More and more payments are becoming uh, digital. Uh, for example, for the first time this year, uh, electronic uh, clearing has crossed paper based clearing in India. And then you have the whole recharge market. Only 3% of mobile recharges a month are done electronically by people like uh, Recharge and ATM. 97 are done physically. Then there's the whole uh, e-commerce business, which is going to go from you know, 15 billion to 60 billion in the next uh, four years. And that's all, a lot of that is COD payments, which all go digital. And then, of course, there's what's the whole uh, uh, mobile revolution. Smartphones will go to 600 million by 2020. Aadhaar today is at 930 million, will go to a billion by March. Uh, the smart, uh, the uh, bank accounts will grow, uh, bank, partly because the government is pushing bank accounts with the Jantan program, as well as the RBI has given 21 new bank licenses in the last six months. Uh, imagine in the last 60 years, they have given 14. In the last six months, they have given 21. There's going to be a certain explosion of innovation uh, because of these banks coming in. And uh, with Aadhaar authentication, the smartphone is now going to have biometric capability. So if you look at your Apple iTouches, the latest Marshmallow from Google has integrated authentication. The latest Lumia from Microsoft has Iris authentication. The latest Samsung phones will have Iris. Basically, biometric will be inherent to the smartphone and it will cost less than $5. So once you have smartphones with biometric authentication, we can link it to Aadhaar, and you can have one click, two factor authentication on the smartphone. So the phone becomes one factor authentication, and the uh, biometric authentication becomes the second. So with one click, two factor, you can have instant transactions. And then, can so you touch upon uh, one click, two factor a bit more. Yeah. See, what what happens is if you look at uh, what do we mean by two factor authentication, right? We, because of financial system and the fraud and so forth, most systems are going from single factor. You may, for example, log on to your Google account and search you your phone. Uh, so there, your password is one factor, which is what you know. And the uh, OTP to your phone is what you have, what you possess, which is the form. So typically, uh, uh, two factors means you have two different way, two different authentication credentials. So one factor is what you know, which is a PIN or a password. Second factor typically is what you have, which in the earlier days used to be a credit card, now it's your form. But biometrics gives you a third way as to who you are. So if you do a biometric authentication with Aadhaar, you are actually confirming that I am this person by using my fingerprint or my eye. 
So if I now the problem is that if you don't have all this, your logon becomes cumbersome. Right? I mean, you have to enter a password and remembering password and all that. Now I just press a button. Like I I touch the thing. Apple Pay, for example. I just touch the touch ID of the form and I make a payment. Because the phone is one factor and my fingerprint authentication. Right? But there's local to Apple. It's a closed system. So what we're providing is the world's first open multi-factor authentication. So the phone becomes one factor and Aadhaar becomes another. So I just take my phone, look at you and click and it's two factors, phone and your address. So this dramatically, uh, the convenience of payments will become huge. And then there's another thing which is happening which is the unified payment interface which is coming out of uh, the uh, NPCR which will allow any-to-any -any payments, both push and pull. Right. So fundamentally, my point is that there is regulatory change with 21 new banks, there is technology change with phones with the biometrics, there is a business change because new new agents are already, for example, KTM, barely 4-5 years old, there is more payments than any bank today in India. So you know, all these things are happening uh, very fast. NPCI has a thing called immediate payment system, which does more remittances than money orders did in India. In three years, they all took money orders. So you know, when you bring in this kind of technology disruption, in a very short time, they can overtake uh, existing models. So all these things coming together is creating the equivalent of what happened in 2009 in the telecom industry. is happening in the financial sector in India. And so when you have that kind of disruption, it also creates lots of opportunity. Pretty interesting. So basically, you're saying we're setting up the ground because of all of this technology for a lot of things to change in the next 10 years. It's part technology, part regulation, part business part capital, you know, today uh, a company like uh, Alibaba puts billions, half a billion dollars into ATM and that's going to continue. So you're going to get global capital into this. Money is going to drive this. So money, capital, entrepreneurs, technology, design, regulation, everything comes from that. So what's more, most interesting is that, you know, the regulations have freed up now. So why do you think there has been a change? Because the Indian government has mostly been a regulation industry, right? They really had the license charge and even after that there were a lot of goods and regulations. Uh, so what's causing that change in the fact, you know, the well, I think uh, this particular regulatory loosening up is the credit goes to the Reserve Bank of India. And the Reserve Bank of India has been a role model in how to do calibrated re regulatory innovation. Uh, what happened was uh, they realized that payments needed to become simpler, cheaper, faster, etc. So uh, I guess they felt that the existing financial system was not doing it uh, as, as they would have liked. So about a few years back, they created a category of payment providers called PPIs, prepaid payment instruments. And they gave a large number of non-banks licenses to offer payments. So MobiQuick, Paytm, uh, Oxygen, uh, all these guys are really PPIs under that thing. And that was a great decision because it allowed people to both have physical outlets called business correspondence as well as mobile wallets. And that led to the whole mobile wallet revolution. And at the same time, the rise in online commerce, you know, the fact that I could buy something at uh, Amazon or Flipkart or book a show at book my show, as well as the rise of uh, you know, the, uh, the in-app in purchase, like uh, I have a Uber or Ola app, and inside the app I want to make a payment. All this provided uh, new ways of payment which had to be embedded in a smartphone. So these wallets became very popular. Today, uh, Paytm has hundreds, claims to have 100 million wallets. Uh, so I think the logical conclusion of that wallet revolution was to make them full-fledged banks. So in these uh, 21 banks that they have given licenses, uh, 11 banks are called payment banks. They can't do loans, they only do payments. So they have to make money by being efficient in payments. So this is a great example of uh, regulatory innovation in a calibrated manner done by the Reserve Bank of India. So we have to give them full credit for that. So uh, you recently authored a book, uh, Rebooting India. So, you know, can you talk about that? Why do you, uh, it's about reshaping government with technology, and why do you think it's a reboot? And well, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, I think, what is, what's happening in the rest of the world? I mean, you know, uh, we, technology historically has been used by businesses, right? So businesses have a business and they do technology, and they used to buy some software, put up a website, and enterprise com companies would sell technology to them. But today we are in a world where people are reimagining an industry with technology, right? So Ola and uh, Uber are fundamentally reimagining urban mobility by the app on your smartphone. Airbnb is reimagining accommodation. Airbnb is the world's largest hotel chain. 
without owning a single uh, bedroom. And you see that in every industry, you are changing it in your business. So this reimagination is possible because of the ubiquitous smartphone, apps, payments, ma maps, GPS, all that is coming together to do that. So our thesis is that India is a very young country with huge aspirations. Viral Shah is my co-author of this book. He works with, he works with me in Agar and he's also the co-inventor of the language called Julia, yeah. the next generation language which is for IoT and so open source language. So he and I wrote a book together. And our thesis is that India's population is bursting with aspiration. Everybody wants to. And you know, if the aspiration is non-linear. What that means is that there may be a child in Bangalore whose parent or father works as a driver with someone and his mother works as a, as a maid or something. But that child wants to be a doctor or astronaut. So suddenly the aspiration is unleashed. And technology has unleashed it. Everybody knows what's happening. They see the internet and so on. So and currently the Indian system of governance is 19th century stuff. So, so this, the governance model is not matching aspiration. And that's the reason you see all this this whole noise, right? So when you we're not we're not able to meet the millions of a billion the aspiration of a billion people, then you have a problem. That problem then manifests itself from religion, caste, AMO, reservations, all that starts because people are being frustrated that the system is not able to meet that aspiration. So we think that the fundamental reimagining required of the way you come up. So this book looks at that. We talk about other experience, digital cash, how to transform the healthcare sector, power sector, and so on. You said the whole gamut of You should read it, buy it and read it. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the whole purpose for us to conduct India Hacks is basically create a technology uh, mobility. You know, people should be, more people should be adopting. There's been a recent wave of going from services companies to product companies. A lot of innovation is happening outside of India. So we want to, you know, enable developers to kind of pick that trend. Sure. However, what I've seen is that, you know, a lot of tech people, and I think they'll agree with this, they've been largely impervious to the changes that have happened in a technology level, at a technology standpoint in financial services. You know, IFPS, as you said, are overtaken money order. Majority of people in Bangalore are doing online transactions. One of the days they fill out a form and then go to a bank and, you know, withdraw money. That still happens in tier three, but tier one and tier two cities are largely internet banking. And you know, developers are not knowing this technology that's uh, being created uh, and the revolution that's taking place. So how can they contribute? You know, how can they be part of this ecosystem? Yeah, you know, I think our whole uh, attempt is to uh, platformize this whole thing and allow innovation to flourish. And you know, uh, uh, you know about the thing we call the India stack. The India stack is essentially a stack of APIs which have evolved in the last seven years. The basic uh, API is the authentication. That is, I gave the example of iris and fingerprint authentication, which will be on every cell phone in the next uh, few years. Uh, so that allows, and Aadhaar allows that. Now, Aadhaar is going to hit a billion people. So imagine if you have a billion people in India who can do online authentication on the cell phone with their fingerprint or iris. This is seriously you know, opening up the world. So that's the first level is the authentication. On the authentication and using authentication, we have something called Know Your Customer. So basically, I can use Aadhaar authentication to release my name and address from the Aadhaar database to a bank. And the bank can open a bank account. Or I can release that to a SIM card provider and get an instant SIM card, and so on and so forth. So the ability to use electronic KYC to open a bank account or get a SIM card or open an insurance policy suddenly makes onboarding of customers uh, very simple on the form. Third layer is that how you can using Aadhaar you can do a digital signature. <coughs> so we already have two, three of our people providing the service where I sign with Aadhaar. Now why that's important is that I can make the entire thing paperless. So on a phone I have a form, I fill in the form, then I can sign that with the Aadhaar digital signature, encrypt it and send it off and it's not reputable. So that creates a paperless system. Then we have an architecture of what we call as digital lockers which allows you to create multiple repositories, like think of it as Dropbox with security and all that, where you link your encrypted records to an ALA number or some identifier. And then you can use that to uh, uh, make somebody get it. For example, when you graduate from college, uh, the college can encrypt and digitally sign your degree certificate and transcript and give them in a repository, and they'll send you the address. And when you go to a job interview, you just point them to your repository, it's all electronic. They're creating an electronic ecosystem for sharing documents in a secure manner. 
And then we have this UPI, which is a universal payment interface, which allows mobile to mobile payments. And then we're developing something called the electronic consent architecture. It says that now that I have online authentication possible, every individual can authorize the release of his data for some purpose. For example, I want to borrow money. I can authorize the income tax to release my tax returns to the lender, the lender or my bank to give my bank statement or my payment company to give my payment record. So all that big, big data, which is going to be huge, I can control and say, I, I will give it to the lender. The lender will then have machine learning algorithms to figure out how best to, whether this guy is a good lending risk and so on. So I can automate the whole process of lending, which means billions, a billion people can get loans. The whole idea is to create these platforms. And everything is designed to be open. India is the only country which will have an open stack. So a guy sitting in his garage can build apps for this stack. That's the thing that we can accomplish. So you essentially mean to say that uh, I could be a developer sitting somewhere and I can leverage, uh, let's say, the digital locker and create my own, <coughs> create my own locker? Totally. Well, you would, you can, well, you, want, you can develop different business models. You can decide to be in the locker business. Okay. So like you'll be like a Dropbox or a Google guy. Or you can decide to say, I'll use the locker system. For example, I'll give you an idea of an application. One of the problems we face is what happens when I change address, right? So, you know, I, I live here and I've got an insurance policy and a rental agreement and loan and all that with an address. Now, suppose I go and go somewhere else. I would go and tell each of these journeys that, you know, I'll change my address. So, if somebody could say, I'll build an app where you register with me. When you change your address with Aadhaar, you change your address only once in the Aadhaar system. Then you authenticate with me, then I will get the correct address, I'll verify with the Aadhaar system, I will new address. You will give me a list of uh, your uh, partners where you want the address change. And I will inform electronically, I'll inform all those guys that your address has changed. So suddenly, address change becomes one transaction of multiple. I'll just give an example of some guy in a garage doing it. So this, will, this innovation will get unleashed. I don't know what ideas will come out. You know, think about it. You know, the internet is 40 years old. Right? Internet was designed as a platform for actually for secure communications uh, in military. And uh, it was, you know, it's only in the early 90s that the web came and then the browser came, Mosaic and then Netscape. It's only in 1995 that the internet started being used for commercial purposes. Right? And now in, in 20 years you have Google and Facebook and all that stuff, so you've got a trillion dollar economy on the internet. And who could have anticipated then that all this would happen? Similarly, GPS was also a military application, which was put in the commercial domain in 2000 the last acts of President Clinton. And within five, six years, you had Google Maps, and now you have Uber, and Foursquare, and all kinds of things. So innovation is something you and I can't predict. You know what great idea somebody will have. So we see the job is to put these layers of open APIs into the public domain at scale, so that people can build apps. And then, and now with the smartphone and all, people will not be all, I don't know what apps will come out of this. So for somebody, if somebody wants to get started, what's the easiest way? Where can they go and just get started? Well, I think you know what uh, I think what Hacker Earth is doing with uh, iSpirit is very important because uh, we want to create a community of developers around the India stack. I think creating the developer sites, creating discussion groups. Uh, you know, it's, it, you know, how do you create a system? For example, uh, Viral was telling me this Julia language. There are 100,000 people around the country, around the world who are using it, and they're all helping each other. Right? That's how communities develop. So we want a community around the uh, India stack, which hopefully you guys will help in doing that. And then, once people learn what is possible, it's up to their imagination how we use it. In fact, if you remember, you've done the uh, two uh, hackathons, one with uh, one with uh, Costa, Labs. Costa Labs and one with uh, and yeah. Brian. In both cases, some fascinating ideas have emerged. But then we don't have an ecosystem of taking them to market. So the other part of the game is we are talking to VCs and others to create Aadhaar related funds. So let's say you have a hackathon, and then you have to the idea them all. Then those guys want to start company, then there will be funds to specialize. We have to create that ecosystem going. Entrepreneurs, capital, technology, all three have to be in place. Sounds very interesting. Uh, I think uh, developers definitely need to look at it in more detail. And, and I'm pretty sure a lot of innovations are going to come out of it. So we have talked uh, you know, a lot about Aadhaar, uh, uh, enabling a lot of digital revolution. Are there some other points that you can cover as part of that? Uh, you know, how Aadhaar can uh, probably change a lot of things that we are doing today, yeah. which are not digitized? No, I think Aadhaar is multiple. At, at the root, it's an ID. It's 
an ID that has been established uniquely. Now, giving a unique ID to a billion people is a non trivial problem. So the way it operates is that everybody submits or gives a biometrics, which is the 10 fingerprints and eyes of both the eyes. And once you enroll, your data is obviously encrypted and sent, and it is compared against all the people that already exist in the database. So let's say there are 500 million people in the database, and a million new people enrolled. It's 500 billion transactions a night. The world's largest matching, one of the world's largest biometric matching engines. And it all operates in a room this size, the size of your office. Because technology has moved. But this, nobody has built, this is built by our guys. And I think that's the power of how if you take the best talent, and the people who work on this have worked at the top companies, built apps, they work at Google, like this and that. So it's not that they're really serial entrepreneurs or sole companies. They're the kind of people who work on this project, as well as the very smart people who come in. So they built the world's largest biometric data. So uniqueness is a big part. Why uniqueness is important is a big part of government experience. When governments make lists of beneficiaries, there are a lot of fakes and duplicates in that. So if you insert the other number into the list, then automatically all fake and duplicate people get out of the list. LPG alone, the government last year saved 12,000 crores, $2 million, just by using Aadhaar and LPG. So government spends about $60, $70 million on subsidies. So you can clean up 20% of that at $15 million. So this is real money. Yeah. The total cost of doing Aadhaar is about a billion. So for an investment of a billion, you're getting multi-billion dollars. So from a government point of view, savings. Then of course the authentication allows you to do all these apps. The KYC allows you to make India paperless. These are all different, and there's something called the Aadha payment bridge, where I can link an Aadha number to a bank account. And then I can send money to the Aadha number. So, it, so I don't need to know the bank account. We have 100, no, 210 million people with Aadha link bank accounts today. So for these 210 million people, you have a mobile app, I want to send money to you. I don't need, I just have to get Aadhaar and Aadhaar. So all that encapsulation is possible. I think we will all lecture on this one. Fundamentally, it's pretty powerful. So this is actually very fascinating because you're not only, you know, by building Aadhaar, you're not only solving the problem that you have to have a billion people on the system, you're also doing the matching in real time, you're doing the encryption. So well, matching or real time, matching is in batch because enrollment happens around the country. Packets are sent uh, to the headquarters. Then stack as a stack of billion, and then you run it every day right against the fact. So, but it's massive. Typical turnaround time for one day. I mean, uh, we process a million and a half per day. So, I would actually call it real time because you are doing a billion matches in a day. So that's all. No, it's five hundred billion matches. Five hundred billion matches. So, you know, that's that's a lot of technology that's been built. I'm pretty sure you know people out there they don't really know about the scale of technology yeah. that we have built in our system. So, you know, I have another question for you from the perspective of banking. Uh, you know, we've already seen some pretty good innovations happening, a lot of fundamental shifts happening. But what do you think is going to change in the next five years? That's going to be very significant in banking. Well, I think everything that you want to do in a bank, you can do on your smartphone. You can uh, open an account, you can send money, you can receive money, you can apply for a loan, you can get a loan, you can repay the loan. And uh, therefore, the, the, so it's going to be a big, uh, big fight as to who will own the customer. So if I can own the customer through my mobile app, then that's what is going to get me leverage. So I think uh, that battle is going to be fought one by existing banks who already have presence and brand and all that, and by newcomers and uh, startups. And these 21 bank licenses will add to that. Because they'll all come with new capital. So I think, uh, you know, if one is to design a bank today, you can design it with very few people and build a bank for 100 million, 100 million people. So that's fundamentally changing the economics of the people. We are going to see a period of extreme disruption because of all these factors. And uh, it's going to be the existing guys, all the new guys, I don't know. I don't care about that. As long as it happens, the people are going to And digitization at scale, I think. Imagine. Only 3% of recharges are digital. We think blocks are only 3%. So India is a 92% cash economy. And what this UPI does, Unified Payment Interface, it allows any to any payments. See, today what happens in the wallet world is that you remain within your wallet. It's a P2M application. If I have a Paytm user, 
I can use uh, my Paytm wallet to pay at a Paytm uh, merchant. So if I'm a merchant, I have to have a Paytm wallet, I have to have a MobiQuick wallet, I have to have a Chiller wallet and HDFC wallet. Now with mobile any to any, I don't care where your money is. So it's like, think of it, if, if, if in the mobile world, only Vodafone users could talk to Vodafone users and only Airtel users could talk to Airtel. I have to ask you what phone you have, you have Airtel, and we can't talk to you, I'm on board of phone. Or I have to, uh, you know, get have two phones, one for, so it's a messy thing. So, the UPI does to payments what uh, interoperability inter does to mobile things. So, suppose I want to transfer money to you, then I just send money to you. I send it to your Allah number or your account number or whatever it is. And it may be that my account is in HDFC bank, your account is in Paytm bank. So, transfer. So any to any allows person to person payments. Because person to person requires both sides of the leg to be able to talk to each other. What that does, it creates the basis for going cashless. But today you can't go cashless because I need cash to do any to any, uh, person to person. So cash will always be there. If I can do cashless person to person, then it will migrate. And because technology will lower cost, the cost of that transaction will be very low. And some business guy will say, I'll take, I'll eat that cost. So let's say that the cost is 50 paisa. Say, look, I'll absorb that cost. I'll give you free cash to cash. So that means today the beauty of cash is no transaction cost. If I give you 500 rupees, it's 500 rupees. So tomorrow someone will say, okay, I'll transfer 500 rupees to my digital account. I'll not charge you anything. So, so then that will that will create a market for cashless. So you said about 92 percent people do cash. So 92 percent transactions in India. 92 percent transactions are cash. So, you know, what are some things that, uh, in addition to Aadhaar, how can we you know, really penetrate into tier 2 and tier 3 cities where there's a lot of these global mom and pop shops, almost everything? No, see, you, see, historically, uh, cashless payments were done using cards, right? So, you, you, you popularize debit or credit cards. That's how Visa and MasterCard began. That's how NPC and the Rupee card. The thing with cards is that this issuing cards is, uh, you know, uh, a challenge, right? Because I have to send a card, I have to send some, Speed post, that would that cost 100 bucks, and another car, I send the pin, another envelope goes. So the cost of getting people on cards is very expensive. Second is merchants have to put cost machines. Now, that is becoming simpler with people like EasyTap who have a mobile phone and all. But still, there's a process of getting cost, uh, cost going. But think about it if every smartphone is, a, is like a card in the hands of the consumer. And if every smartphone is a cost machine in the hand of the merchant, without doing anything else, then you're home now. If 10 million merchants have a smartphone, and 1 million consumers have a smartphone, then merchant transactions are happening without any infrastructure. So once merchant transactions happen without infrastructure, then cashless will go So for example, look at e-commerce. Right? E-commerce is going from say 15 million to 60 million. 60% 60 is uh, COD. It would be very expensive for this one. So let's say that you can go to from 15 million, 60 percent COD to 60 million, 10 percent COD. Suddenly, the increase in digital transactions is 10 times. So, uh, what's I think what Aadhaar has enabled is you know all these uh, all these different stacks that we have spoken about. I think other countries, uh, more advanced nations, have seen them happening in bits and pieces. You know, something came into some particular system. As you said, for us, it's the WhatsApp moment for them. It was big enterprise you know, coming into the world, forming over years. So can the other world, you know, rest of the nations take something from Aadhaar as a, as a platform? Yeah. Uh, and, and can it be implemented? Uh, it can be, but you know, a lot of things are going on. Like, in fact, I'm in Washington next week with a major conference on the unique ID organization that we need to figure out on how to take the idea global. And then we'll have a lot of So obviously there's a lot of global interest in replicating this. But what has happened in the West is that these, what we call the India stack in the West, is owned by companies. Yeah. Right? So let's take uh, uh, Apple Pay. Apple Pay is both Apple phone and the biometric is in the phone. So nobody else has access to that. And that's the direction that other guys are taking. So we are the only country where this is open platform. So a developer in the garage in Kormangala can use the, uh, this infrastructure to create a Apple Pay like experience, that is the power. It's not controlled by two or three large companies. It's there for everyone to use. So the fact that we have a unique open stack is really very, very strange.
So I think uh, that uh, I come to my end to my questions. Uh, we'd like to open it up for a few uh, questions from the audience. Of course. So do we have any questions? So with uh, uh, all this uh, interstate technologies, layers like KYC and electronic <coughs> consent uh, signature, I foresee actually a lot of middlemen actually going out. Like the way the other industries have also revolutionized. For example, if I'm applying for an insurance somewhere, maybe I don't need a broker or I'm applying for a loan, maybe I don't need a, any any more. <coughs> so what what are the different kinds of this uh, middleman businesses that we see on the ground? No, I think obviously disintermediation will happen. Mm -hmm. And in theory, a guy should be able to buy anything on his phone. Mm -hmm. But India is still, in many sense, an assisted economy. People like someone to help. But now the assistance is done through a stack embedded in the phone. So the guy who comes to you to open a bank account need not do anything. So everything is on the phone. So the security, the privacy, the authentication, everything is on the phone. But tomorrow, a Flipkart delivery boy can open a bank account. Think about it. So let's say I'm Flipkart delivery boy. Disney Flipkart, the Amazon, Snapdeal, whoever it is. So the guy comes to your house. You try to do COD. He says, why don't I'll give you a good wallet account. And he'll open it immediately. From then on, we go cashless. So the power of the idea that a guy delivering flip card or you know, go for the whatever it is, they, they can open an account. It opens up the mind. So you may have intermediaries, but not the old kind. You may have anyone can be an intermediary because the technology is a device. So uh, uh, we are hosting India Stack at Hackerath and it's actually in quite advanced stage. Uh, but uh, what kind of uh, uh, label it, uh, the whole stack is it and what kind of uh, con like are you also accepting the developers outside of the core organization to create those no, no, no. in fact there is an ecosystem uh, developed by the UIDA where you have what are called as authentication user agencies or AUAs or KYC user agencies KUAs uh, who can apply and become that so already there must be a hundred of them around so the process by which you become an authorized user of the so that's as far as authentication KYC goes. Similarly, the CCA, which is the Certifying Authority, you can apply and become an e-sign provider, which allows you to do this and hopefully lock us. For UPI, you go to NPC, which provides, uh, you know, there of course you have to be a bank to be in the main UPI, but somebody, a bank can hire a developer to build an app. So, so it's a system of creating, you know, circles of uh, this thing to bring in more and more people into the app. Today. So we were also having questions via Twitter, and you know your good friend Sanjay has asked one question: is what's Ooh. the impact, Sanjay? Yeah, it's for me. Yeah, right. What's the impact of moving from five percent to ten percent of electronic transactions in India, and what is achievable in the next ten years? Well, I think the adoption of uh, cashless will happen much faster than we think, because the the basic problem has been we have never had a solution that gave us superior convenience and value to the customer. Because digital is expensive today. You, know, you, you do a debit card transaction and all, you call that game and all that. The cash is free. Yeah. So one is you have to make the uh, cash transaction convenient, cheap, and all that stuff. So I think many other guys are thinking about how to make it better than cash. Second thing is, what is the incentive for somebody in the cashless economy to come uh, to the cash economy to come to the formal economy? Because cashless is yeah. good. No, no, outside the system to each other that. But the moment I can use my digital exhaust or my payment trail to give you a loan, suddenly if I enter the formal system and have digital payments, then I can use the digital trail to get a loan. And that's a huge thing. I mean, only 3% of Indian businesses get credit from the banking system. It's all informal, state fund, money lender, SMFI, all that. So imagine if, uh, you know, 20, 40 million small businesses can get loans using the payment history. <coughs> Historically, lending in this country is asset based. You own an asset and you take loan against asset. We are talking about loans against transactions. So the transaction history tells us what is the likelihood that you will be uh, good if you return your money. So that is going to change. So I think if you can get the value proposition of cashless right and it can get the lending right, and everybody will come in, so it will be much more than 10% of the experience. That has a big impact on the economy, the efficiency. Uh, it will bring people into the formal economy. It will increase the savings of the system. And the, and the macroeconomic impact will be huge. So as you rightly pointed out, there are a lot of benefits from moving away from cash to cashless economy. But uh, 
I was reading, reading it somewhere, one of the biggest resistances in India is the uh, cash comes without identity. Your cashless will come with an identity. And there's a lot of back money. Yeah. No, I think uh, I've talked to many people who have built applications for this small businesses and others. Where presumably, but I spoke, for example, Bharat going off Tally. Tally is the largest institution. He says that it's all about convenience. People are, if it's convenient, people will adopt it. And the advantage of coming into the system, okay, fine, you're becoming visible, but also now you can get loans. See, I'm a small business running a small retail shop. I can't expand, we have no, no, no money to expand. So if I can get a loan because of that, the, the, the cost of coming in, which is becoming formal or paying taxes, is worth it because my growth will go. So there are all smart people who will figure out. So we have to make sure that, apart from making this cashless more convenient transactionally than cash, we also have to make sure that you have an upside in joining the system. And the upside we think is credit. There's a question from Twitter uh, listener. Uh, what's the quantum of smartphones having biometric recognition and how much growth do you see? How, how much? How much growth do you see? Yeah, here? now, uh, if you see every iPhone now is biometric, right? Because all the new iPhones have iTouch, which is uh, biometric fingerprint reader. Uh, now with uh, Google Marshmallow having fingerprint, I assume all the new phones will have it. Samsung is launching both phones and tablets in the next two, three months with uh, Iris. The latest Lumia phone from Microsoft launched about a month back has an iris scan. So I think uh, it's going to be a standard feature uh, of every smartphone, at least certainly initially maybe high end and then every smartphone in the next two years. The other issue is that one is having that uh, reader or uh, scanner on the phone. But the second thing is that should become Aadhaar compatible. And that's what, for example, we are idea system without testing three or four phones to make the iris compatible with the uh, other. So both phone has to have the basic uh, ability to read the biometric and it needs to connect to the other system. Both these things in the next two years will have millions of phones with that feature. You spoke about cashless being a mode for which people will pick up soon, but I still see a lot of people because they don't see like in cash payments you see it going out of your hand. In cash, it just happens at the background. So a lot of people are a bit wary of adopting this uh, whole scenario. So what do you think uh, would be a better way to ease people into this? No, but think about this way, boss. Nine hundred nine hundred million mobile phones in India. They do three billion recharge transactions a month. What's a recharge transaction? I walk into a retailer, I give him 5 rupees, and I get 5 rupees of uh, minutes or talk time on my phone. That is cashless, that is digital. So, 9 million people already, already understood what is cashless, right? Because, I mean, they're understood as, as talk time, but believe me, they will move very fast. We have seen that. Uh, everybody goes and 99% uh, of mobile phones in India are prepaid. Prepaid means I have to go and charge. To, to charge, I have to give you money and get talk time. So you already have, people have conceptually understood physical cash versus digital cash already. So there was some recent ruling on UID by Supreme Court whether it should be mandatory or not mandatory. So how does it impact that? No, first of all, that was really more about government, some government applications and Mandatory is not, uh, is a voluntary. But the usage we are talking about is private usage. There is no constraint on private usage. If you want to use it voluntarily, it's you know, your business. So it's actually uh, off the top of question regarding the credit cards and RBI. So still including India, the biggest bottleneck for any SaaS company uh, is that credit cards have to factor authentication. It's not someone just, uh, a customer puts in the card and which he can charge it once a and uh, I heard that RBI did something up to 1000 rupees or 2000 rupees can automatically do that. But is there any progress happening on that or are they thinking on that? Well, I'm, I'm not privy to what's happening, but like Wallex today is single factor. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that they may offer single factor up to a certain value. Mm -hmm. But I think we just want to jump on this. Okay. On the smartphone, if I can, this UPI which is going to get launched in the month or two. Be able to set up your own thing. So you don't forget biometric. 
I can set up my own pin and then I, I just, you know, my phone is one factor and the pin becomes second factor. So this whole thing is going to become much simpler in less than six months. So uh, follow up to that, uh, wallets in some sense are automated if you have enough uh, yeah. balance in the wallet. Yeah. This is because RBI took, uh, and the system allows single factor in wallets. And so essentially you can do it in monthly for whatever. So what can also happen is, uh, for example, right now there are payment companies like CC Avenue, uh, Citrus Payment, which interact with the different uh, most bank accounts and they can, uh, you can like, process the money from there. Uh, what can happen in this scenario if wallets become more, even more mainstream, there could be payment companies <coughs> interacting with the different wallets. So how that ecosystem will, will change, I, I don't know what will happen mm -hmm. the ecosystem. But uh, different models will emerge. Today, for example, uh, I have to have four or five wallets on my, on my thing, and each of them has a little balance and all. They kind of transfer or to transfer it back. It's, it's all cumbersome. You know, Hopefully, all that will get cleared up. One last question, and then we'll have to. Tell us a little more about the developer community efforts that you're doing to build around the other ecosystem in India. Yeah, well, again, uh, not me so much, but uh, iSpirit, which is the volunteer organization is trying to evangelize this India stack and, uh, uh, you know, and try to create a developer portal with uh, developer community, discussion groups and all that. And uh, there might be more of them, but I think HackerUp is uh, going to look at posting uh, it as well when you're launching. Sometimes we'll have a Yeah, so that hopefully, with, and you guys have how many 200,000 people have 500,000. Yeah, so those people. Find it how the developers know what's happening then. <laughs> so I think we'll call it a day. Uh, so thanks a lot for you know for the audience and thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you. All the best. <laughs>